Um, hey guys, so um, the uh, uh, four parts to this. Uh, the first part is is kind of like my boilerplate thing that I do, um, uh, which is you know like a, a history of uh, stop motion or, or animation, but I focus more like on stop motion animation and kind of like build the the heritage from you know Malay to uh, Willis O'Brien to Ray Harryhausen to me, which is how things kind of crossed over. Um, uh, but at the beginning of it, uh, I put in what I think is the most important thing, which is a, a very solid foundation in art history, and. Um, so a lot of the first images uh, are like inspirational images that I had, and everything is like more or less focused. There's le there's no real um, delving into like portraiture or uh, uh, landscapes or any of that. I, what I was interested in and is exploring is the um, depth and breadth of the imagination of things uh, realizing things that you cannot see and and making them manifest as a thing and so uh, that's what this first part is about and I always found that um, going back into history is the well that that you drink from it's not from the franchise bullshit that you're force fed through a fire hose today. It's through, you know, it's through the history of the shit that we're, you know, about, that artists are about. And um, so, and that, that begins as so far as we know um, in the caves of Lascaux and Chevet. And it goes back earlier than that, but the, the most graphic representations are of uh, mankind made its stamp by a hand, a human hand imprint on the wall. And, um, and they reconstructed prehistoric animals. I mean, they didn't reconstruct. They drew what they ate. And so if there was a woolly mammoth, they would, you know, represent that. Um, uh, and many times dramatically about the hunt. And, and so when the, fir when the first um, skeletons of, of mammoths and mastodons were, were found, I think by the Greeks, they uh, uh, um, couldn't figure out how the skull worked. <laughs> and where the nose goes, zoop, you know, for the trunk, there was just like a big hole. And that was the impetus for the myth of the Cyclops. That was, there was a giant that used to live before mankind, and he had a big one eye in the center of his forehead. And um, that was kind of it until they started like digging up more of these things and uh, figured out, um, wow, how did this go together? And they, so they used the paintings of the Cro-Magnon people, and they realized, oh, there was a trunk. It was an elephant. You know, holy shit, that's great. And, and so, yeah, there's the plethora of like amazing images that you get from these guys who were the you know, first recorded visual artists that, that we have. But they also did phantasmagorical things and mental things. There's a lot of phallic and vaginal imagery on the walls. And, uh, there are spectral beings. There are um, there are humans with animal heads, and like all kinds of, of imaginative stuff. What for? We don't know, but we do know that it came from the imagination. And so that's the that's the well that that you drink from, and then you know uh, go on down the line and. Um, you know, wherever you decide to like dive into, you know, history, um, you know, the Hindus had just these amazing, amazing pantheons of like gods and monsters and thing after thing after thing after thing after thing and layers behind layers and behind layers behind layers. And what is reality? And it was all like very philosophical, but represented by two dimensional artwork. 
And so that's what this first part is kind of about, is about what we owe to history. And, and then it kind of graduates into, that changes into um, doing uh, uh, reconstructions of prehistoric life and, um, and uh, uh, imagining what these fossils that were chopped out of the ground, you know, uh, 200 years ago, meant and you never knew you always had to use your imagination to figure out you know what was this and what was that and how, what was their milieu and what do they eat and what was a herbivore and what was a carnivore and how do they walk and um, so uh, science incorporated and you know some really uh, terrific um, uh, painters like Zednik Burian and Charles Knight and Rudolf Zallinger to um, recreate images of what they thought the dinosaurs were like. And so we can begin. And I'll just talk over some of this stuff. Uh, I'll leave the first part alone, but I'll talk over as we get into the, the um, more of the movie stuff. I'll talk over that. OK. One, two, three, go. So like dystopias and utopias and heavens and hells that are all included and in ghost stories that are included in the cosmology. Hieronymus Bosch was a really important character to me as a kid and motivated a lot of um, what became the subject matter for Mad God. So I was always interested in, in the spectacle of life and, you know, the amazing distances in space and the phantasmagorical characters that you could meet, both for good and bad. And so, um, you know, George Millay was the guy that um, really, wait, is this, yeah, um, got everything started. And uh, he was a magician by trade. You guys know all this stuff, so I don't have to talk about it. But, you know, all this stuff is hand colored and uh, it's pure invention. It was like a guy that goes like, 
wow, cinema is this thing and you can apply it to, um, you can make all kinds of tricks from it and create all kinds of illusions that allude to the unseeable um, and the unknown or the, you know, known but never before seen. And then Windsor McKay uh, did the first uh, cell animation. And this is really pretty amazing that this was the first time, I don't know how many takes they did of this stuff, but this was the first 2D animation that was ever done. And then Willis O'Brien, um, in the teens, he, he shot a lot of his stuff on rooftops, uh, was fascinated by prehistory. And so he made like a number of, uh, of short 35 millimeter films for Edison in the early teens, I think. So this was like the re really some of the very first stop motion animation. And then in 1925 for First National Pictures, uh, O'Brien was hired to create the dinosaurs for the Lost World. And these are stop motion dinosaurs that are uh, integrated into a background um, of live action water. And that really got the whole visual effects uh, thing going in, in a way that we're familiar with still today using um, full miniature sets and projections and mats and matte paintings to integrate all, all of the things. And all hand tinted, or I guess this is just tinted. And then um, in Russia, Ladislav Sterovich was doing um, more puppet oriented animations um, that kind of became the inspiration for uh, Henry Selleck and Tim Burton to do, you know, uh, their stop motion pieces. And if you look carefully, you can see that Sterovich uh, was experimenting with um, motion blur. And so he, he was like the first guy that, that uh, you know, started to figure out how to integrate uh, stop motion maybe into live action because he's got a live action background plate here that's got like blurs on it and a stop motion figure here but he goes yeah! and um, now there's blurs on the thing he, he actually physically moved the puppets uh, during the exposure And Starovich's stuff is, uh, there's a lot more stuff, and some of it is just like absolutely insane. And he, he pretty much did all this stuff on his own. Uh, and I think he, he had a daughter that worked with him, and um, that was the crew, so far as I know. And then um, Willis O'Brien was the guy that, uh, when I was five years old, um, I, I, King Kong happened to be running on television in 1955. And that was like the first thing that kind of went like, you know, um, influenced me significantly. I had no idea what it was, uh, but it, it uh, it made me like really interested in pursuing uh, primarily like dinosaurs as a kid. You know, like little boys are like they go into like trucks or they go into like dinosaurs and monsters. And I went dinosaurs and monsters. 
and uh, started studying dinosaurs and looking at 1955, around the same time that I saw this on TV, uh, Rudolf Zallinger's uh, paintings of the Natural History Museum in New York. And so I became fascinated with paleontology and started studying that and tried to keep up on all the, the newest uh, paleontological theories. 1949, O'Brien... Um, uh, uh, was the uh, visual effects supervisor for Mighty Joe Young, and this is where uh, he mentored Ray Harryhausen, who became the guy that probably did like 80 or 90 percent of these shots, uh, stop motion. And uh, then Ray Harryhausen was the guy that uh, significantly influenced me. Because a lot of this stuff wasn't available. You were just lucky if you happened to see it. Uh, later in his career, O'Brien's you know career went down. He was used to working with a studio. Studios weren't making these kind of movies anymore because they weren't they um, they didn't uh, make enough money. So he started working on super low budget things like the Black Scorpion and the next thing, the Giant Behemoth. And they're really cheap and low budget and kind of crappy. But uh, the shot designs are like really pretty amazing and apocalyptic and on a nickel. You know, there's this, as phony as it looks, it's a great idea. <laughs> you know, so. And then, of course, uh, Ray Harryhausen uh, was mentored by Willis O'Brien and um, went on to make a number of films. Uh, this was The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms that. Uh, um, Ray Bradbury had written in the early 50s. And Ray Bradbury was a very influential character in my life in that he was the only adult that told me not to listen to all the other adults that were telling me not to do this kind of stuff. So all, all this kind of stuff, the uh, Beast of 20,000 Fathoms was... Um, uh, remade uh, in Japan later years on as Godzilla, but Ray's was the first, and then a lot of the stuff he did was from the newspapers, but then he came out with this fantasy, and it was kind of, this was perfectly at this point in time for me, when I was like into kind of studying dinosaurs and the science of dinosaurs, and then could see a world that I'd never seen before of magical beings. And with the dinosaurs, there were these creatures that lived before mankind that we can't see, we have to imagine. But in our imagination, we can imagine whatever we want. I was shooting Dragon Slayer when Ray was shooting this at Pinewood. And um, so I met him up on the day that he uh, chopped the head off of the Hydra. And uh, we were going to go out to lunch. We went to a pub. Um, we had a couple of beers. And uh, it was like, uh, so Ray, do you need to get back to work? And he goes like, no, let's have a couple more beers. Um, I'm going to wait till I see the dailies because if the sh that shot worked, I don't have to redo it again. <laughs> so I'm just going to wait till I see the dailies tomorrow. And then, you know, I, I got lucky by living in this time that allowed me to uh, 
do this stuff. And I mowed lawns and I, I bought an uh, eight millimeter stop motion camera and started messing around with visual effects and animating clay. And then G.I. Joe's came out and that gave you, uh, you know, um, you know, um, articulated skeleton when you could afford to do that. And the lighting is all in my bedroom. That's my bathroom for a uh, bathrobe for the background. And, um, you know, uh, this is the best advice I can give anybody that wants to be an upcoming animator is like anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> if I could do this, yeah, you know, then, yeah. And then I got really lucky uh, and I found this. Uh, Mentor, I saw him on television. He made a, uh, uh, a sci-fi movie called Time Tomorrow. His name was William Stromberg, and Bill was embarking on his next project, which was uh, from based on a Ray Bradbury story called The Sound of Thunder. And so I sculpted and cast the uh, dinosaurs and did a lot of the animations, and eventually got hired at Cascade Pictures uh, to do television commercials, and started making my living that way after going through uh, I, uh, after I graduated from college. I uh, was uh, moved up to Hollywood and started working for Cascade, and that was kind of my graduate program for uh, visual effects and animation, and uh, met a number of new mentors like um, Jim Danforth and David Allen, who, who taught me a great deal. But you got to do a lot of stuff, and a lot of stuff really quickly, and so you can, um, you know, um, you did some of that stuff with stop motion. This is forced perspective work, um, what we call a hanging miniature. And so I built all the miniatures. They're really simple. but uh, And some of the stuff, you look at Gar Darby O'Gill and the little people, there's some amazing forced perspective shots that they, they did in that. Ronnie, that's what we need. And then we got lucky, and um, Dennis Mirren uh, was working at, at Cascade, I mean, at, at uh, Cascade, and uh, got hired on to do camera work for uh, Star Wars, for the spaceship stuff. And he introduced us to George, and then we did uh, built a bunch of, of the cantina sequence uh, creatures, and we played them as well, and while we were doing that, George saw that I had some stop motion puppets that I made when I was 16. I gave him the idea to do this as a uh, stop motion scene, because previously he was gonna do it as a uh, actors in costumes. And then we moved up to the Bay Area, did uh, this, uh, Empire Strikes Back, and started experimenting with, um, with motion control, uh, making like kind of Boonraku rod puppets and getting blurs off of um, off of the stop motion characters. And then for Dragon Slayer we built a more robust uh, uh, kind of Boonraku uh, stop motion puppet rig so this kind of made me change how I thought about, because um, stop motion to me is like sculpting in time, and you go from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing to pose, and, um, but for this you had to imagine everything broken down into axes, so you had to think very abstractly about how all these axes like, <laughs> kind of like a lot of stuff in computer graphics today, and then I designed a bunch of these characters, um, that Stuart Freeborn made and designed um, Jabba and uh, his major domo and Rancor, this thing. And so I performed this. My, my hand went up through the back, and there was another guy that worked the legs, another guy that worked the arms. And we shot a lot of this stuff between 72 frames and uh, 120 frames a second. And so you, you, it's the absolute antithesis of stop motion animation where you have to make, you have to just nail this thing by shooting like really quickly, super fast. And we would have tons of dailies and George would just say, just pick the five best shots and like send them to me. I don't wanna have to sit through this. This was a complicated shot that took me about six weeks uh, to, to figure out how to do. 
but it was all I made like a whole uh, rig uh, where I could project the action of the high speed stuff of the logs falling down and match the character into that. And then I took some time off afterwards, um, after uh, Jedi, and made a uh, stop motion movie about dinosaurs called Prehistoric Beast. And uh, with the intention of like selling it to you know uh, 16 millimeter prints to schools as educational stuff, and they said, "No, we can't show it to kids because it's like too scary." And so, um, but it led to this show, which is a, a CBS show we did on dinosaurs. And so we were able to like just completely put this all together. My wife currently is the CEO of our company and, and runs everything, uh, but she started off mixing blood for me uh, for Roger Corman movies and kind of moved up the chain and she did all the sound effects and editing on this. And then uh, my friend John Davison, who uh, produced Piranha, hired me to um, do this for Robocop. Pointed at Ed 209. Yes, sir. So there wasn't a whole lot of money for this. So what was clear to me that what we needed to do was to build a full-scale prop and figure out a choreography that would work, and it could work, because the thing was a static object. You could keep it alive by a sound effect, by a bass pedal chord, and keep the character present even when it wasn't moving. And then you go to the stop motion, if it had to be ambulatory. And then um, Jurassic Park came up, and this was a huge thing for me. I mean, this was like the, everything changed here. And everything went from uh, stop motion, go motion, to digital. So this was a huge learning curve uh, for me. Um, and there weren't that many computer graphics animators that were um, uh, that good at the time. And so uh, we developed this input device, which was essentially a stop motion device that we could uh, get stop motion animators that knew about how, how to make stuff in the, the world that the char human characters are in match. And if you're doing a puppet film, you work with your own um, physics. But when you're doing this kind of stuff, you're locked into getting the weight and the mass of the, the characters to feel as though they exist within the, the background. And Jurassic proved um, the viewability of uh, computer graphic effects, and then we went on to do Verhoeven's um, Starship Troopers. And this was done at a very t uh, time, not long after Jurassic Park, but you just didn't have the workforce to be able to do this. So like kind of everybody had to be trained and nobody knew computers that well. So it was a really vertical learning curve. And then uh, we got um, involved with this for about four years, the Twilight series, which was a piece of shit, but... <laughs> But it kept the studio alive for like four years, you know, and that was that was the meaningful part of it. And then we did this. So now we're working for China doing this stuff, 
and we just do this wacky shit for them. And it was like, I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> and these are all like mythological characters that have some meaning for the Chinese. And it's like, OK. Um, but you know, it was it was kind of like doing, and then television commercials. Then we did the the um, chess set. Uh, uh, once they wanted to reboot that, and then more commercials and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Commercials. Ted, funny, cute animals. We were stuck in the cute animal gulag for about like eight years. And um, yeah, no, all this stuff. None of these movies, I think, you know, made any money at all. <laughs> But then we, we kind of changed our course and we started getting into, you know, uh, more uh, environmental type stuff. And it wasn't just creatures and characters, but a bunch of the stuff is for um, um, whatever the space TV show was, Cosmos. And then we got hired by these Chinese guys, uh, Anwei, who's like the biggest company in uh, China to do these uh, fly rides. They're about four or five minutes long where everything has to be reconstructed um, digitally. So what we do is we find a, the province, and this is Anway, and um, we do um, Google Maps, we find out what the dance floor is, and we put all this stuff together in a way to create the choreography then go out and send out guys with drones and they they do photogrammetry of the area and we bring that back and we just reconstruct everything uh, digitally. And it's projected on a gigantic screen, three times bigger than this room and you're in like 180 degree, I mean, um, what are they, not 180 degree, what am I talking about? Six degree you know, uh, of movement uh, seats. And so it's actually pretty amazing kind of a thing if you want to do that. So anyway, that's that. So <laughs> Well, um, so I thought we could uh, start a conversation about uh, technique a mm -hmm. little bit. So there was a question given to me uh, to ask you earlier just about um, the role of drawing and how much do you draw? What role does it play in your process? Either storyboarding or design or both. Yeah, it's it's pretty significant. You know what what I yeah I tend to not write that much. I write just certain tones and feelings, and so the script for Mad God is like eight pages long. Hmm. It's not long at all, but it it puts me in the zone that I know that I need to be, and the process is protracted over so many years that. I will just draw out a scene. And I'll draw like little, you know, thumbnails and like just draw out a scene, draw out a scene, draw out a scene. And um, I might not shoot it for like a year, but then that gives me a year mm -hmm. to like go back and go like, I'll try this again. And I won't look at what I've done before, and I'll, I'll do it over again. And then in another three months, I'll do it over again. And then another three months, I'll go over it again. And um, then I'll look back and go like, I'm going to take this and take that and take this and take that and, you know, put that. And it, it, strangely enough, you know, I, I, you know, part of the experiment for me was how to kind of train your unconscious mind to develop unconscious material. And, and it tended to be like when um, I did, just before I shot, I would do something. That tended to be the way it was. And it was like, I wouldn't even look at the other stuff. I'd just like throw it out and just like uh, let the unconscious edit everything. Mm. So this is kind of a follow-up about storyboarding as well as shooting and editing. 
Uh, Mad God had just this incredible deliberate pace to it. I, I mean, I was very aware of when it was kind of ratcheting up and, and kind of making um, for a tense feeling and when it would let go. Um, would you plan, do you see, do you kind of see things that way? Do you okay. kind of imagine the edit? I mean, it's all intuitive. And so that's how it's shot. I mean, it's like, you know, for certain scenes, I rely on editors more. Like if I'm shooting live action stuff to, to assemble stuff and put it together. But for the more stop motion stuff, it, it's like, you know, I'll cut it in. And, you know, and then, and then you see, and it's like, oh, I need mm, another shot. Or like, no, that plays perfectly well, or get rid of that, you know. Um, so I have a question about animation, um, also looking at your entire body of work, from sort of the creature and machine effects um, on to, to Mad God. I mean, how is your process? Can you tell us a little bit about your process? How do you approach a shot to bring it to life and move it? And then also, how has that process changed from, say, you know, the 70s to, to now? I mean, it really depends. I mean, if you're working on a theatrical feature film that is intended to, like, integrate the material into live action, mm -hmm. you have to be a lot more precise and um, worry about editing and smoothness and make it fit into the photographic background plate. So that's all our technical stuff that's like you just have to do that I don't particularly care for, but yeah, you, know, you just have to do it for that kind of stuff. Did you have to do more research? I, oh, I mean, I, I would, I would generally do like a lot of stuff. I would, um, um, you know, when before, you know, uh, I was even doing anything. I like really studied Edward Moybridge's work. You know, I would just like pour over it, and and just consume it until it's like part of your your DNA. And then for every project, I, it would essentially be the same thing. I would just do as much pre, you know, it's like uh, you hear like sports people talk about this kind of stuff, you know, is they they visualize winning. They, they see themselves doing this stuff. And so it was a process of seeing this stuff in a way that was like, I see it. I totally see it, you know, and um, and then executing it. But but that usually came through a long process of like, um, you know, uh, for the Walkers and the Tauntaun and, and Empire, um, we went out to a beach and we shot an equestrian rider shoot, you know, and we went to uh, uh, animal joint where you, we could shoot an elephant. And I put like Edward Moybridge like marks on the ele elephant's legs. And we shot 35 millimeter film on that. I would take that back and put it on the moviola and I would just study, you know, the frames over and over and over. And, you know, learned a lot from doing that. Um, for instance, for the, for the walkers, you know, uh, some of the first tests we did was like, well, it's the biggest element, uh, animal you can find as reference. Well, it's an elephant. And so you would look at that stuff, and then you would shoot um, a test. And it was like, eh, that looks like an elephant. <laughs> it, it doesn't look like something that's 500 feet tall. It looks like something that's 12 feet tall, which is like not surprising. And um, so then you just keep honing it, and, you, and then you come to the realization is like, oh, this thing is so big, it's got to have three points of contact all the time. And so that, that um, kind of informs the pantomime of it and it just tells you what to do. I love that. Do, do you approach um, shots with sort of machines? I mean, it sounds like you did a lot of research with animals for some of that stuff. Uh, do you approach those shots differently than when you're getting into a character, like a creature or a human? Is it more sort of... Um, self-reflective when you're doing that kind of stuff where it comes yeah, from you? you, you know, it, it all comes from the script. Like, what, what, you know, what does the movie require? And um, for like Dragon Slayer, it was like the thing was really old and really mean and really crotchety. And um, that was, those were the guidelines, mm -hmm. you know, for it. So, um, uh, but 
then on the other side, I did a lot of research on, um, on uh, with like big lizards, Komodo dragons, stuff like that. Look, look at their footfall patterns. Look at different kind of flying animals like bats and stuff like that. And um, you just absorb it, you know. And if you can, if you can, you know, turn it into your, you know, mental DNA, then it, it kind of becomes intuitive, intuitive thing. And so I had for I had for a bunch of these things like huge volumes of um, notes that I took on developing stuff. And then when it came time to shoot, it was like, <laughs> like okay, you either know it or you don't, you know. Yeah, I, I love your story about, um, sounds like you did a lot of prep and rehearsal for, for the walkers. I love, love your story about um, begging George Lucas for an opportunity to shoot it, you know, certain things again and having him, you had to convince him to do another take. I mean, could you talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, it's very un unlike today where you get these, you know, morons that are like your visual effects supervisors that, you know, some are really good and some are just, all they're, they're middle managers is really what they are. And all they, what to validate their miserable existence, all they uh, can do is find what's wrong with the shot on like a pixel level or something like that. It's like, really? Okay, you know, so you kind of have to deal with it. But, you know, like back in the day, it was like, uh, you know, like you were asking, is like, I, I did this shot where the Tauntaun runs up to the top of the hill. And I, the take, the first take that I did, I just thought was terrible. And George said, no, it's great. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I go, um, let me do it again. I can do it better. I said, no, it's fine. I was like, no, no, I, I can do it better. I know I can do it better. It was just a rehearsal. And he goes like, oh, okay, but you can do one more take. And um, then that worked out. But, you know, our, we'll, we'll now, you know, get calls from visual effects supervisors on, like, movies. And there was one call that this was not a show I was working on. Blair Clark was the supervisor. And he was, uh, back in the day, the, if you had a studio that did visual effects, uh, the people at that place were the supervisors. But then there came a point where the studios didn't trust the people that were making the money to send their own people out to make the stuff, so they hired their own people, and they turned out to be morons for most cases but the, you know they were just like these middle manager guys that um, all they looked for were what was wrong all the time what was wrong with the shot it was like you know I was talking to Dennis Murin about it you know a while back and he went yeah we didn't think about what was wrong with anything you can see what's wrong you know and then you fix it and um, but what would make the shot better? What would make the shot funnier? What would make the shot more exciting? What would be more dramatic? And that's what all we cared about. And you know, these days you get these people that are just, they're essentially quality control people that are worrying about pixels and shit like that. And it's like, yeah, you know, it's just. Things have, things have changed, yeah. yeah. It was like the cowboy days, you know, where you just had these great bosses and you just did the stuff and you got it done. It was like the Wild West. And then finally everybody from St. Louis moved over to San Francisco. <laughs> and it was like, oh, well, it's like, I guess we're civilized now. Um, could you talk a little bit more about spectacle uh, in general and also how it's portrayed in cinema and how you try and use it in your own work? Well, that was the thing I think as a kid that really grabbed me was the idea of something bigger, you know, um, than, than yourself or even bigger than the world. And, uh, and you know, that's where when I was a kid, I, I got like uh, fascinated by dinosaurs and, and you know, uh, things you needed to imagine and then you know with Ray Harryhausen movies and whatnot um, you know kind of like like the Hindu paintings or some of the phantasmagorical 
things from the Scour Chevet. It, it just, um, it's bigger than you in in a in a way, and and to like em, embrace that like kind of existential bigness and and figure out a way of getting and just as a kid you know growing up with those movies and even going on the Star Wars movies they were all they what they had to sell was spectacle mm. not unlike you know the Iliad and the Odyssey <laughs> you know it's like yeah same thing over and over and over again and and it's just part of that tradition of um the kind of you know um, you know heroic imaginative bigness of life that you don't experience every day um, but is there it's just like um, like the matrix or something no it's it's actually there you're living in it but you just don't know it um, you mentioned uh, sort of taking a break from one type of work um, and sort of processing and digesting for, I mean, decades, really. And you said that was just such an incredibly valuable time. Um, could, could you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, how it influenced you, and then yeah. also how it could be beneficial for any artist, right? Well, like, I, I don't know with production schedules how, how, how practical it is. But um, when um, you know, I, I, I made the first six minutes of Mad God and shut the project down and got it rebooted, um, uh, there was a 20 year lag in there where, you know, I had to deal with, you know, changing from, um, photographic effects to computer effects when we had a couple of kids and that take all, takes all your time. You don't do anything then. And, uh, then it, it gradually started up again, but during in that 20 year period, it really gave me the time to uh, study a lot. I, I just did a lot of reading. There's a lot of really interesting, uh, um, if you guys are interested in like stop motion, uh, a guy named Kenneth Gross wrote a couple of really interesting, they're kind of poetic, but you know, they're, they're a little bit too academic for me, but his writing style is like, it's like imaginatively engaging. And he, he kind of writes out a, uh, um, history of puppetry uh, that goes way back to like whenever the Greeks and the Romans and all that stuff and what the meaning of puppetry was to theater and expression and then the Balinese uh, and Javanese uh, 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 shadow puppets you know were like this huge thing and I saw Julie Tamor's one of her first things uh, Juan Darien was a shadow puppet play that I saw in the late 70s in San Francisco and went like, holy shit, this is like amazing. And, um, and so there's this... this what was uh, it about that piece that, that grabbed you? You know, it's the same stuff that's in Mad God. It's like you can just enter into this like kind of... It's not not even a metaphorical world. It's it doesn't even make sense. It kind of makes sense that way, but it's it just it's magic. Sure. You know, I mean, that's all it is. It's like is is magic, and so having twenty years to like investigate and study that again. At the end of it, it, it becomes part of your DNA, your creative DNA, and you just go, you know, when you get lucky enough to start things back up again, then you, it's kind of like you're prepared. You've done everything that you need to do to get in the ring and, you know, fight. Right. It's amazing. Uh, I guess I would just uh, finish with one more question about process. You mentioned, you said something amazing that stuck with me, which is it's amazing what you can get done if you just don't think. Um, which you, you were sort of talking about personal things as well as professional. Could you just elaborate on that a little bit? Well, a lot, a lot of the Mad God ex experiment was about how, how to like coach the unconscious. Mm -hmm. And the unconscious thinks in its own strange and mysterious way. And uh, I, I really try to avoid um, any kind of intentionality to anything. I'm, I'm like, I'm just like going with like this kind of blind feeling, 
in a way. And so there's n nothing like really specific. And I just want to stay dumb. And dumb is a good word. You know, it's not a bad word at all. Dumb means you approach. And that's what it's all about for me anyway, is like being a kid. Mm. I just like to play with stuff, you know, just like I was a kid with toys, you know. And I want to see it like that, you know. And I, I was telling you the <laughs> last night at dinner, so I got two kids, two daughters. And one of them worked for me for about six years on Mad God, but working on a movie sucks. I'm going to get a real job. <laughs> and so she goes off and does that. And the other one uh, is um, a couple years behind her. And uh, she comes to me when she's 10 years old and she t says, uh, Dad, I have a problem I need to talk to you about. And I was like, oh, you're pregnant, right? <laughs> it was like, and, um, yeah, so what she would do is like uh, every night after dinner, she would go up into her room and she would play with her plastic animals. And she created scenarios and she had, she had a whole life outside that were these animals. And she said, I'm 10 years old and I am too old to be playing with toys. And if I play with toys, people will be, make fun of me. And I said, Maya, <laughs> if you become a filmmaker, you never have to grow up. <laughs> and she goes, really? And I went, Absolutely. Let me show you. I love it. Yeah. And so we did. I started showing her the ropes. And now she's, uh, she got into like documentary stuff. And she's made some, you know, she's made mostly documentaries. And uh, now she's working for the Wall Street Journal doing stuff for them as they move from print to media. Right. Great. Uh, well, we should move to Q&A. Um, so uh, if you guys have questions you'd like to ask Phil, I believe um, you need to line up next to the, uh, the microphone in the back there. Is that right? OK. So feel, feel free to ask. Ask away. I'm surprised not many more people got up. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, Mad God was awesome. I haven't seen that before, and it was so cool. Um, question Did for you. Did leave? I didn't, I didn't know. I was sitting in the front. I like to sit in the back and see how many people leave. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't notice anybody. Leave. I think the people that left were the first people that got warned. I saw three or something. But uh, <laughs> question. When you're working on... Jurassic Park, can you tell us a little bit about the T-Rex uh, animatronic that would sometimes move without anyone doing anything to it? That would what? The T-Rex animatronic would move on its own sometimes? Uh, well, that wasn't my department. That was Stan Winston's and Mike Lantieri's department. So they, they did the full scale you know, things for that. And they were like giant robots. And so, you know, I was never there when anything dangerous happened on the set. But yeah, they would set up, you know, like cones and, you know, do not cross this line kind of thing. Because it was like, a, you know, like a giant robot that could just kill you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, there's one person. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Right. Uh, if you will, can you talk a little bit about the visual side of Mad God? You have such a robust kind of world in this. Uh, like, what was your biggest visual inspiration for the kind of world that you were trying to build in that film? Well, initially, when I was a kid, my dad was a, a painter, and he had a big. Um, uh, he had a, a library of art books, and he, he saw that I was into like monsters and that kind of stuff when I was a kid, and he turned me on to Hieronymus Bosch. And so that was a huge influence. I like, kind of knew like by the time I was 10, that's what I want to make a contemporary version of Hieronymus Bosch that deals with the culture and the milieu of the time 
Um, and I didn't even understand it at the time, I gradually came to that awareness, but um, yeah, which is what Bosch did. He was a chronicler of the time. And um, uh, yeah, so, um, and it, it was kind of this idea of, um, of just being immersed in a journey. I almost saw it like as a Michael Palin voyage to India. <laughs> you know, it's just a travelogue, really. And it's not that complicated, but it, you know, because of the things you meet and the things you go through on your journeys, you know, it, it creates its own narrative. And uh, so, the, you know, that was, that was really important in terms of like the look, um, you know, it's just like, uh, I, so I'm working with this kid that I picked up in Stuttgart at FMX and he turned out to be like this really smart guy that came out and started working with me and I, I got him um, to a student visa to come out because he was a German and Germans are like really good like camera guys and and whatnot. And so, you know, I got him to come out and and help me on that God. And um, uh, there was this impediment that we needed to go over, get over. And that was that Arnie needed to know what we were going to do. And it was like, I don't know. <laughs> you don't do anything. You know, you, you, you have the idea for the shot or the scene or the setup or whatever, and you don't think until you put a camera up there. You may have made a whole bunch of props, but the camera tells you what to do. It was like, and the staging. And, you know, so you, you can't operate from a position, I don't feel, of intentionality of saying, it's got to be like that because this is what the storyboard goes on. Blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. Everything's fluid all the time. Everything changes. And you, you have to be free to change all the time. And that's what I think, uh, you know, is, is, you know, the secret sauce of all of this stuff is just using your intuition and knowing and feeling what it, what it should be like and then just building the camera to that. And, you know, you know working with the, the composers and the sound guys is like, oh my God, everything is, is like uh, so carefully done. And like, the guy that is the DP that I work with, I go like, no, I didn't. We just like shoot it, <laughs> and and they had to explain to us. No, actually, what you do is you build everything, and you are painting a, a thing. And it was like it was so intuitive to us that we didn't realize what we were doing. But you are you're composing, you know, a a, a shot. Thank you. Hmm.